So mm -hmm. how it feels to be shot? <clears throat> well, it depends. It depends on the uh, caliber. Um, you know, the Mini-14 is a fairly hot round. It was developed during World War II for sniper action. It's meant to pass through the body. Um, in my case, that's happened, but um, I had one particular instance because of the angle of the trajectory from a 50 foot high wall and my movement, I was hit in the back and it lodged next to my spine as opposed to passing through. Um, that's the only way I can explain it. 30 years later, they removed it. But um, it knocks you down. It knocks the wind out of you. Um, it, um, you know, the first thing you're thinking if you stay conscious um, is, you know, what happened. And then you realize almost immediately, I can remember being shot in the side of the head with what was called a long range sting around. Now, that was from the tower, and that was 50 feet down. And uh, the projectile was such that it hit me in the side of the head and peeled my scalp. It literally lifted my whole scalp up, hair and all. And um, I remember thinking to myself immediately that somebody had sundied me, punched me from the side. That's how hard it hit me, uh, because it actually buckled my knees. Um, and then I recovered and turned to confront my opponent and there was no opponent there and then realizing that I had been shot so I had to turn back to the opponent I was dealing with um, just by way of giving you an example and so the feeling of that was like being sucker punched uh, being hit in the body is an entirely different thing it knocks the wind out of you drops you like a sack of potatoes if you stay conscious you realize you've been shot there's not much pain um, depending on being stabbed it depends on what you're being stabbed with um, if it's uh, a weapon that's been finely crafted, um, then it's razor sharp, and you know what it feels like to cut yourself with a razor blade, right? So intensify that 100, to 100 fold. Uh, that's what it feels like. Um, so if it's, a, if it's a rougher weapon, it's more rugged, it's not as well um, manufactured, um, then that can be painful. Um, you know, because it's like being stabbed with a sharp stick. Um, you, you feel it going in and you feel it coming out. And, um, you know, the biggest thing you hope for, because back in the day they had what they called bone crushers. And this was a huge weapon, well over 12 inches, honed back on both sides, probably two inches thick, with a big old handle on it. And sometimes they two-handed. And if they ran it into you, the thing that you hoped for was that, one, it didn't hit anything vital, and two, that it would actually hit bone because oftentimes a bone crusher if it hit bone would stick in the bone and that gave you an opportunity to take it away from your opponent all right huge thank you to michael thompson he's been so generous with his time this is the fourth podcast now within a matter of months millions of people have viewed his videos on the channel and there is an endless fascination with one of the founders of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang who served four and a half decades in the California state prison system, was shot 22 times. I mean, there's a point in the story where just mind blowing people that they watch this and they're thinking, how can this even be? They had to build their muscles so thick because they had two minutes for these knife fights before the guards shot them dead. And if their muscles were thick, then the burning of the pellets from the guns into the flesh, they could withstand that for a little bit longer while they were enduring these knife fights. That's just, just one little example of the epic <laughs> journey that Michael has been through. And um, we've got Andrew Gold co-hosting this evening. Hello. Uh, yep, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, hello, Andrew Gold from the On the Edge with Andrew Gold podcast, Sean's longtime co host and maybe even friend, I might say. <laughs> do, do appreciate that, Andrew. <laughs> so, 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 Michael, you know, we, ha we had a guy fly over um, from California, he served 40 years. He did 20 of those, he said, housed around where you were housed. And he told mm -hmm. us these stories about Corcoran Prison 
he went and I know you previously mentioned it, but the level of detail that he went into and, and the depth, I had no idea. And I've, I've pulled these articles up. There's Los Angeles Times, there's The Independent. Even in the UK, this was getting reported on back in 1996. Right. Violent inmates at California's top max security jail were purred off in staged fights. Mm-hmm. As watching prison guards bet on the outcomes. In some cases, prisoners who refused to stop fighting were shot dead in a ritual that became known as Gladiator Days. Known enemies at Corcoran State Prison were released from their cells and purred off like fighting cocks in empty prison yards. And the guy who flew over, he told us, all the staff lined up. They brought out the female staff members. It was literally like a spectacle, like, like the Gladiator Arena. What, what, mm-hmm. what, what, what can you confirm about that, Michael? Well, it's true. You know, I can, I guess, just right off the top, confirm that those things were happening. You had a um, uh, Department of Justice investigation that was conducted um, into that very aspect. That that didn't occur until after uh, eight inmates had been killed, shot and killed. And um, so then the Department of Justice, as well as the FBI, came in and did an investigation, and the uh, California legislature, um, Romero, I think was her name, she was the chairperson of the Senate Select Committee, and uh, she held uh, hearings on that. There's um, an enormous transcript available to the public if they really want to get in-depth into what was going on, but it's true. And um, I know that from firsthand knowledge on a couple of levels. Not only was I the subject of being set up a few times um, for fights, but uh, I also worked as the captain's clerk uh, on that particular yard that they're talking about. And um, so not only would uh, staff gather to watch these fights, um but what was to me even more interesting was that those fights were videotaped and so they would bring those into the office and more staff would even gather around they they kind of you know make their way in and check out the video and um they of course they were taking book um on the outcome wow and um yeah it, it was uh, pretty extreme but hmm. Corcoran is where um, the guards developed what was called the Green Wall. And the Green Wall was a takeoff of um, another gang, essentially. And the members of that Green Wall were called uh, sharks. And um, they engaged in their own form of violence, which was pretty extreme. And I was the subject of um, a few of those beatings. Take us inside your mind, your headspace, when you're just realizing you're being pushed into a fight by guards and, and that if you don't, you're going to be killed by them. What does that feel like for you? Mm, it's a great question, Andrew. Um, you're constantly prepared in an environment like that. Um, the term is when the gates rack. And what that means is, is when the doors open. Now, oftentimes those doors will open with no warning, nothing. And the next thing you know, you're out on the tier um, with your enemy. And if you don't go out to the tier, of course, then your enemy comes into the cell. And if he has a knife, then you've really uh, set yourself at a disadvantage because of the uh, small space involved. If you're out on the tier, you're actually able to move better. So you're in front of the gunner and um, the key, just like in anything else, is that you have to keep moving. So it really becomes, as a result of preparedness, second nature. Um, It's probably difficult, I think, for most folks to wrap their mind around this level of violence. You know, I've had people um, express to me the idea of uh, these altercations uh, being sensationalized. Um, You know, the truth of the matter is, is that when I tell these events as they happened, and like you asked the question is what was in my mind? um, First and foremost is survival. But I always put a check upon uh, the the degree to which I express 
the facts associated with this because most people can't deal with it. Um, the blood, the violence, the gore, um, you know, the aftermath, all of that are extreme. And um, particularly when, if you stop and think about it, you're actually fighting for sport. Um, this is a, a, a live or die type situation, but the fact of the matter is it's for sport. Now, some of the combatants would go into the altercation with that in mind. And then others are conditioned to it's a live or die type situation. So typically what they would do to ensure that these, these battles occurred was that they would pit um, enemies, rival gang members against each other. So they're almost assured that the altercation is going to occur. The tragedy, I suppose, in that is that um, everyone knows that, you see? And you would think that rather than engage in that, that if you had a choice, that you wouldn't. The fact of the matter is, is that you don't have a choice. That's what I mean by live or die. So that when the gate racks, your door opens, your cell door opens, you go out and you start looking around to see, you know, who it is. And, um, you know, if you have a weapon prepared, then you take that weapon with you. If you don't, then, of course, it's a matter of assessment. You know, where's the gunner? How many gunners are in the tower? You know, where are the rest of staff? Oftentimes, you could see staff standing up in the windows in the tower watching. And um, but the main thing is, is the gunner that has the M14. Um, now, sometimes they would use shotguns, but um, there's a general rule. And there was particularly in Corcoran, no warning shots. So that when you engage, you know that you're not going to get a warning shot to, shot to stop. It, um, they're firing to hit you. Um, unfortunately, um, if it's out on the shoe, what were called the shoe yards, security housing unit yards, those were very small yards. And so there wasn't much room to move in. And um, most of the individuals in those situations incurred headshots. So they were killed immediately. And um, that was from the M14. Now, hmm. back then they also had the nine millimeter and uh, that was what was called a glacier round. And um, it was devastating. But um, again, I guess going back to your question, Andrew, about uh, your mindset, um, it's not something really that you think about. You're conditioned, you're trained, hopefully, um, to go out in a tier and, and you know, take that assessment of the situation and essentially how you need to maneuver to survive. And that's the key. Right. I'm just going to read a bit more just to confirm this to the public as documented by the Independent as far away as the UK was reporting on this. Mm -hmm. So guards and inmates described macabre scenes in which prison officers gathered in control booths overlooking cramped exercise yards mm -hmm. in advance of fights, which were sometimes delayed so that female guards and even prison secretaries could be present. The officers were armed with gas guns that fired wooden blocks and rifles. The excuse for purring off prisoners, often members of rival black and Latino gangs, which exercised powerful control, was an official policy of integration, which mandated bringing longtime rivals together at close quarters in the hope that they would learn to live and let live. The policy mm. was widely derided as a loser that forced inmates into fights and left officers with split second decisions about life or death. Mm. It was rescinded. Yeah. Yeah, that that's well reported, you know, and again, um, I want to emphasize that it really doesn't even begin to touch the surface of the uh, character or nature, if you will, of that violence. It's extreme. You know, we hear a lot nowadays about extreme sports. Um, they don't compare. Here you're going out to particularly if it's a, a shoe yard. And uh, you come through a sally port. And then the guard that sits above you in the tower, he keys the door electronically and you walk out into the yard. And um, again, it's, it's a much more limited space. So it's usually just a matter, now it depends, if you have more than one opponent, 
and which is oftentimes the case, um, then you have to assess, you know, who has the knife, if anyone does have a knife, and typically they would. Um, and it would depend on who would get out into the yard first. They wouldn't allow you, for instance, to just bring a knife out into the yard. But most individuals that lived in Corcoran at, Corcoran at that time that were gang members and knew that this was occurring stayed prepared. So they had a knife prepared. And uh, there's a lot involved there. So it's a matter of having to keister that weapon. And that's secreted in your rectum. And then you're processed out to the yard. So they go through all the motions. They, they strip search you and, and uh, you know, check to see if you have weapons on you and you have to go through, you have to uh, bend over and squat and, and all these other things. But um, most gang members are trained in how to secrete a weapon and get it out to the yard. But one of the key characteristics, depending on the sequence and who goes out to the yard, and this is what tells you that they know what's happening, is that when you get out to the yard, you have to bring the weapon out of your rectum. And so you can actually see that occurring. Some people are very good. Three steps into the yard, and they can have the weapon in their hand if they're prepared properly. Others who aren't as experienced will manage to keister a weapon and get it out to the yard, but they'll go over to the wall and they'll squat down in order to get the weapon out of the rectum. And you're watching all this occurring. So again, it's a matter of um, taking stock, if you will, of the situation. How many there are, who has a weapon, see how many gunners are in the tower, and, um, and then advancing forward to make your move. And, and as always, even in that small space, the key to staying alive is to continue moving, to keep moving, because it makes you um, less of a target. And oftentimes those split decisions that you're talking about is if you take your opponent down, for instance, and say you're leaning over him, um, then you're a target. And that's usually when they take their shot. So they'll take their shot uh, with the explanation that um, imminent harm to the opponent. And so they're justified in it. And typically you'll see that much on the video. You know, and they had a, a terrible habit of erasing these videos. Like I said, I was a captain's clerk. I actually wrote the reports for these. It's called an 837 incident report. So I would write all the officer's reports. I would write the lieutenant's report. And that entire report would then be submitted to Sacramento for review. And usually it was uh, approved and then sent back. And then it was processed. But... Um, that's one of the situations that I actually got into was a um, young man by the name of Preston Tate, black man, and um, he had got into an altercation with a black guard on the tier. And um, uh, Preston spit in the guard's face through the bars. Um, and so what happened was is that he was set up the next morning. Uh, he was led out to the yard with two opponents, Mexican rival gang, and uh, within two minutes, uh, that guard, which had, uh, uh, which Preston had spit in his face, he went up into the tower. He was actually a floor guard. He didn't have any business being in the tower. He went up into the tower, grabbed an M14, and shot Preston in the head. Now, the real issue there was that two hours before that happened, as a clerk, I received the central files of all three inmates that were going to be involved in this in altercation and the notes associated with the fact that he had been shot in the head during this altercation. <sighs> so I had the report prepared before the altercation even occurred. Now, wow. when I discovered everything associated with this, I took that to the program lieutenant at the time. His name was Stephen Rigg and um, asked him to investigate it, which he did he determined that Preston Tate had been murdered. So he attempted to take that information to the FBI. In the course of attempting to take that information to the FBI, uh, he was cut off on the road in his car by the special services unit out of Sacramento, who had learned that he'd taken these documents. Another guard had told on him and told him that he was taking these documents out of the prison and that he was going to expose what was happening. 
This is actually what led to the Senate Select Committee's investigation and the Department of Justice's investigation into this type of brutality. Now, as a result of that Preston Tate incident, eight guards were indicted. All of them were acquitted by a wow. local jury. So, I mean, there's there's a lot that can be said here. And again, I'll go back to that idea that people say, oh, you know, uh, when you tell your stories, you embellish and you sensationalize. They're not even hearing 70% of it. They really mm -hmm. aren't. And it would be, I think, oftentimes, I've had this discussion with many people. I think it would be too traumatic. You know, it, it is um, so far out there that people can't wrap their mind around the fact that these things actually occur, but they do. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I've got, got what's going on here. So my understanding is guards would get potentially people they don't like, prisoners or, or rivals of different gangs, together in a small space to fight, but often maybe taking bets on it or something like that, but often also standing in a tower waiting for it to get quite dangerous so they could shoot and potentially kill one of the fighting prisoners. Yeah, so they're actually obligated to do that. So the cameras have to be on. See, that by law, when they installed the cameras, it was for that reason. It was to determine accountability as to a lethal force and whether or not that force was excessive. Mm -hmm. So they would actually edit those videotapes, um, but they had to be able to account for the fact that a fight was occurring and if weapons were involved, then they were justified based on their policy for using lethal force. In other words, killing the inmate. And after in, eight inmates, eight prisoners had been killed, you know, people began to question, okay, what's going on here? Why are you not able to control this? And um, of course, there were a multitude of questions that came forth in, in the uh, Senate Select Committee hearings. And um, quite interesting, actually. Michael, who was your first opponent and what happened? Well, you mean in Corcoran? Yep. Oh. Well, uh, he would have been um, a rival gang member. Um, you know, I was um, in the unit there, but I was uh, working as a clerk. And um, when I took the step to go to Lieutenant Rigg with this story, of course, um, Preston Tate's attorney asked to see me. And uh, so I agreed to see her and she came in, but she, she was not aware that he had been murdered. Uh, she was essentially suing the department on behalf of Preston's family. So she came in to see me and um, I explained to her that um, um, Preston had been murdered and how he had been murdered and what was involved. And um, that even kicked off a further investigation, but the fact that staff believed that I was now going to testify in court on behalf of the Department of Justice because eight guards had been indicted, uh, they essentially set me up false charges so that they could put me into the hole. And then to control me relative to the potential for me testifying, they would release inmates out under the tier with me um, in the hopes that they could either shoot me or that these inmates would be successful in killing me. Um, neither occurred. Um, only because of, uh, you know, by that time I had a substantial skill set as it relates to um, avoiding being shot, having been shot so many times. Um, the irony, I suppose, is that this is the other side of the coin. Um, of all the times that I had been shot, those 22 times, uh, I was an active gang member and I was engaged in combat with other gang members. And so, at least theoretically, uh, being shot was justified. And uh, I never took issue with it. You know, every incident report that was ever written on me, and so far as that type of violence and those knife fights, I pled guilty to because, in fact, I was. So I didn't take issue with it. But now we're talking about being on the other side of the situation where I'm no longer an active gang member and it's staff that's now worried about me testifying against them relative to their um, illicit conduct uh, within the institution. So, you know, they have far more control over that type of situation. 
and in my case, exercised that control. So um, they made sure that I was housed in a unit that had um, individuals that um, essentially would have loved um, to engage me. And so there was no question about the fact that they would engage me and, and did. Um, but in so far as their names, uh, it was both Mexican and black. And um, it, like I said, essentially what would happen is that, you know, the cell door would open, the gate would rack, and, um, you know, I was always prepared, you know, and, and that's critical, essential. So um, depending on the outcome, that essentially would be covered up. There would be no incident report. There would be nothing about it um, documented. Um, <laughs> If there were shots fired, then they had to justify shooting um, their weapon. So then you would find a report. And this is one of the things that the Senate Select Committee got into. Of all the thousands of pages of the uh, transcripts from that Senate Select Committee hearing, I'm the only prisoner that was mentioned. And um, there was a reason for that, of course. Um, because of the sequence of events leading up to that investigation. Uh, but even Stephen Rigg, when he went before the Senate Select Committee, Lieutenant Rigg, um, you know, he appeared before the committee with a bulletproof vest on. And um, uh, Gloria Romero, who was, again, the, the chairperson of the committee, uh, stopped the proceedings and asked him, she said, sir, um, do you have a bulletproof vest on? And he said, yes, ma'am, I do. And she said, may I ask why? So he went on to explain how his fellow guards had done a drive-by shooting of his own home and uh, that he feared for his life as a result of testifying before the Senate Select Committee on that. Wow. Yeah. That's mad. Just going back to, you know, you're thrown out like a sort of gladiator here. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that you have to keep moving. So I'm, try, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think it because I don't know how you win. Because if you, if you, presumably you've got to watch out, someone's coming to fight you, a mm -hmm. rival gang member or whatever it might be. Uh, mm -hmm. So you've got to avoid that person, but avoid being shot as well. So if you fight back yes. too much, you get shot. If you don't fight back, you get killed by the person in front of you. But mm -hmm. I presume if you just keep running away for, what is it, half an hour or how, however much time, you also then lose status in, in prison. So, so what on earth can you do? The loss of status is not really an issue. If there were some place to run and you could actually get away, that would actually be the intelligent thing to do. Um, but you're not in that type of situation. It's it's very uh, small area that you're talking about. These are what's called a 180 design. That's 180 degrees. So you have essentially a wedge that faces the tower. And so you have to um, confine your movements within that wedge of space. And um, so the idea of moving is just, it's more like a dance, Andrew, is the best way to explain it. So you're fighting an opponent, but in your peripheral, you're watching the guard to see how he's following you. You pretty much know when he's going to begin to shoot if you become stationary. If you engage your opponent in such a way that you lock, like mm, the term is used locking horns. So if you lock horns with your opponent, then you're stationary. Now you're a target, and that's what you don't want to do. So the key is to go out and fight your fight as opposed to fighting your opponent's fight. It's no different than when you get into a ring. You don't fight your opponent's fight. You fight your fight. So strategically, these are all things that you're processing. I suppose the, the beauty in the brain is that it develops a virtual reality as it relates to these situations so that when you step out into a situation like that, you really don't have to take in your environment. It's already processed in your head. And so that's an advantage. You know, if you're, if you're new to the environment, then, you, then you're confused as to um, the environment itself, uh, the position of the guards, um, the access they have. They actually have um, short uh, shot portals that they can shoot out of down like underneath, in other words, if you move your fight up underneath the tower, then they can't shoot you. But they have portals, gun portals that they open, and they can stick the barrel through there and shoot down and still get you, but it's limited. So the advantage is to move the fight up underneath 
the um, the gun tower. Uh, because it, it lessens the chances of the guard being able to actually hit you. If you're out in the open, then you increase those chances because then he can just open a window and he can put his gun through bars there and he has a pretty clear shot. Hmm. So there, there are a number of factors that come into play there. So you said you'd already been shot multiple times and you had this particular mm -hmm. skill set. Were you shot at Corcoran? No. No, that's it's I, I've never been shot uh, in these type of altercations. Um, I mean, I've had him. <laughs> I've had them let inmates out in front of my cell to engage. This was choreographed orchestrated, where they would start a fight in front of my cell. And then my cell door would open and in their attempt to shoot at these inmates, they were actually shooting into my cell, attempting to hit me. And um, but I was fortunate in the fights that I engaged in in Corcoran. Uh, because of the movement, um, I was never shot in those situations. It would have been a, a difficult thing. It, it, would have, it would have had to have been a situation where I was using a knife on an individual, and uh, that would have had to have been captured uh, on camera, and so they were justified in lethal force against me. So uh, it's a matter of not allowing that to occur. Hmm. Well, I, I wonder, Sean, do you want to stick on... Um on on the prison or or move on a little bit to michael's uh, story in general yeah i've just got a, a bit more on corcoran then so you said that mm -hmm. you know sometimes one opponent will be put up against two or three opponents mm -hmm. was that because someone had a particular skill set and they were trying to balance it out mm -hmm. to make sure that person got took down and did, did that happen to you for example first uh, fight one on one. They saw, you know, what you were capable of, and then they started to stack the odds against you. Well, actually, my experience has been is that uh, there's an advantage in fighting multiple opponents um, because you can use their bodies, their energy um, against mm -hmm. them, essentially, so that you're covering yourself. You know, and like I, I made reference to the fact that it's a dance, and that's always been my style of fighting. So they're they're given elements associated with that. I won't go too deep into that, but there's, you know, the water element, the air element, uh, the grounding of earth, there's a fire element. And those are all um, specific techniques associated with combat. And so how you utilize those, how you engage in those, um, particularly with multiple opponents actually works to your advantage. If it's a single opponent, and then you have to modify your approach to that. And uh, particularly if your opponent has a weapon, so the idea is to prevent yourself from being stabbed. If possible, take the weapon away from your opponent, but all the while not staying stationary. So that if you are able to, to um, engage your opponent and um, disable him and then move without stopping in the course of that dance up underneath the tower, then they're going to be hard pressed to justify shooting you. You see, so it's it's comes down to your strategy associated with the tactic that you employ, depending on the number of opponents that you have, and um, and how you facilitate that. So that that's what I meant previously when I said skill set. When you have um, decades, as I had at that time, of experience uh, in close quarter combat, and then that works to your advantage. Uh, the one place that uh, they were never able to get me out onto was the shoe yard that I was talking about. They would not have been able to justify that. The only time that they attempted that was when they had a full yard out. That's multiple individuals out on the shoe yard. And they popped me out of my cell and asked me if I wanted to go to the yard. And I said, yes. And so they, they allowed me to walk out right to the door. And I, you know, it was like it was a test. Um, you know, whether they'd let me out there, had they let me out there, um, it would, they would have been hard pressed to justify it, but they wanted to see if I would do it. And uh, I went all the way through with it and said, open the door. And, um, they didn't open the door, fortunately for me, um, because that would have been a very difficult situation to contend with. Hmm. The this uh, might sound a bit innocent, I don't know, but I mean, these are people who are, are prisoners who have committed crimes, uh, like yourself, but yes. they're not savages, right? So uh, 
is there no recourse in this situation to just say to the other prisoner in this moment, you know, hey, mate, come on, um, let's not fight here. Because if we do, we're going to get shot by these people. Let's just chill out. I know we've got our differences, but this isn't going to be good for anyone. I mean, is that a bit naive of me? It's not necessarily naive. It is innocent. And I have mm. a great appreciation for that level of innocence. It goes to your sense of humanity, Andrew. And, wow. <laughs> um, well, that's a beautiful thing. It's a blessing. Um, I enjoy hearing it, as a matter of fact. Now, you think that uh, just the opposite would be true. You know, say, oh, my goodness, Andrew, you're so naive. It's not a question of that. Reasonable people would like to think that you could approach a situation, situation like we're talking about in a reasonable way, in a humane way. But that's not the nature of prison. And so um, I've had instances where um, entire groups were pairing off to do battle. And uh, I observed uh, guards standing on the second tier. This was at Old Folsom, taking book as individuals paired off. And um, I hollered to everybody and made them stop and pointed to the window and showed them and told them, look, we're their entertainment. So we did stop. And we came together as groups and decided to oppose the guards and did that successfully. Um, but that's an entirely different story. But in the context that we're talking about now at Corcoran in those type of scenarios, um, it's not a situation where the individuals that are being pitted against each other are rival gang members. And so they're sworn enemies, mortal enemies. And so not to engage your mortal enemy, given the opportunity, because the opportunity doesn't often present itself, um, would be deemed cowardice. And you would be killed as a result by your own people. Michael, could you tell us who Mushroom George was? Uh, George Smith. Um, he was the warden at Corcoran. You know, and um, I knew George Smith you know, as an individual. And uh, I thought he was a good man. Um, I thought he was an intelligent man. Um, but he had reached the point in his career where I think he'd become mm, tired. And there was a lot going on at Corcoran. So his subordinates, associate wardens and captains, essentially took control of the prison. And that's what was happening. So he acquired the name Mushroom George um, because it was said that like a mushroom, he was kept in the dark and fed manure. Um, and that was basically true. So, you know, I don't doubt um, that George thought that um, the things that were alleged that were going on were not going on, particularly on his watch. But the fact of the matter, they were. I mean, one of his associate wardens and one of his captains were members of the Hells Angels. And uh, they were not only throwing parties with the secretarial pool, you know, they had uh, uh, club members, you know, wearing their, their patch, carrying cases of whiskey, walk right into the prison and uh, set up, you know, in the warden's office and uh, they would have parties. So, I mean, people say, oh, that didn't happen. Well, I'm here to tell you it did happen. Wow. What has this and, and, experience and actually investigated, oh, on, by the way? Excuse me, Andrew, but sorry. what I just told you was actually mm. the subject of investigation. Wow. I just was going to ask, um, what has this experience taught you about the thin blue line, the concept that people with a propensity towards violence or immoral behavior are drawn to both criminal activities and also police or warden work? It's an interesting thought. I mean, oftentimes, you know, we talk about the thin blue line and we're talking about the idea of... Uh, uh, you don't give up your fellow officers uh, for their unethical conduct. You know, and the irony in that is when you turn to the prison gangs, the idea of you don't snitch out or rat on your, your contemporaries associated with that. And, um, you know, the fascinating, fascinating thing about that is that those codes are put in place to protect the organization. You know, people say, oh, you know, you don't rat, you don't snitch, you don't cross the thin blue line, you don't do this. That's to protect those individuals who are engaged in illicit, illegal, unethical conduct. Now, 
that's to be expected of the gangs because that's what they are. They're, they are factions by some degree of organized crime. And so there's a, an expectation of loyalty to that. You know, it depends, again, on the individual. I'll use myself as an example. I engaged in um, multiple episodes of, of violence with my enemies, um, was developing an infrastructure for the gang, was involved in organized crime. But that organization reached a point where it deviated from that which I believed was its basic code of conduct. You know, for me, it was a warrior code. So that when they took it upon themselves to decide to start killing women and children, then I said, I will not condone that. And if I just sit by and do nothing about it, then I am condoning it. So you, to my way of thinking, I had to take um, active steps to ensure that that issue, the taking of innocent life, was addressed. So the same applies to that thin blue line that you're talking about. You know, we hear a lot about whistleblowers. No one ever stops to think about how much, how much protection has to be placed upon whistleblowers for doing the right thing or the ethical thing as it relates to, let's go back to the thin blue line. You have police officers who are carrying out um, executions, who are engaged in organized crime. Yet their fellow officers are expected to support that because they're fellow officers. So you really get um, no divergence there as it relates to the gang or law enforcement. They're one and the same. It applies the same. You see? And but as a society, we're so conditioned to this idea that, you know, don't tell, don't snitch, don't rat. And there needs to be a lot more conversation about why that is. You know, we now have a saying uh, within the, the various communities that if you see something, say something. You see, and that now applies to domestic terrorism. And it's one of the things that um, I'm working very strenuously on with other people, because I believe it, it represents a real threat to this country and to our communities and to our families and so on. And so, you know, we need to get away from this idea that if you see somebody engaged in activity that has the potential to harm families, innocent ones, the community in general, or this country, then by all means say something. Then that same attitude applies all the way down the line for the same reasons. But oftentimes people don't take that into consideration, unfortunately. That's why there needs to be a lot more conversation about this. So, Michael, this Corcoran prison stuff is some of the most extreme we've ever heard on the channel. Mm. And I think the world, you know, definitely needed to hear the details there. I appreciate that. It's it's important to understand the dynamics of something that could happen. Um, and my ears are still trying to process it all. But just mm. when you think it can't get any worse, I'm going to read the beginning of an article from the Los Angeles Times now mm -hmm. from October 20th, 1999. In graphic and tearful testimony, former inmate Eddie Dillard told a jury on Tuesday that he knew the fate that awaited him when guards transferred him to the cell of Corcoran State Prison's notorious booty bandit, mm -hmm. telling jurors yeah. that his account was too painful to recall in every detail Dillard said he pleaded with Officer Anthony Silva that inmate Wayne Robertson was his documented enemy and a well-known rapist as Silva led him to Robertson's cell that day in March 1993. He said Silva ignored his pleas and watched the door clang shut, vowing that he would check out Dillard's claim and, if true, come back to relocate him. But Dillard said no one returned and he was raped repeatedly over the next few days. I can't describe it, Dillard told the court, breaking down in tears. Half of it I don't even want to remember. I just re remember him raping me again and again and again. I mean, this is just another level yes. of nightmares, isn't it? Well, it is, you know, and oftentimes, you know, again, it, it it's one of those subjects that needs to be addressed. I oftentimes hear, um, usually in the police context law enforcement context you know they threaten people with going to the big house to going to the joint if you drop the soap in the shower you know what's going to happen 
Um, Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. You know, that's a really oversimplified um, explanation of what we're talking about here, particularly as it relates to Rudy the Brute and others like him, because it, ha it happened often. You know, I think one of the worst experiences I've ever had is listening to a man being raped on the tier in a cell, another cell with another person. It's brutal. And, uh, and I've had that experience. But these were the tactics that were employed uh, by guards to control individuals. And oftentimes it was just to feed that for no other reason. And it, you know, it begs the question, you know, what would allow a individual who's been sworn to uphold the law and to protect to place an individual in that type of circumstance. You see, it's, um, it's tragic. As for Dillard himself, you know, I can't imagine, and I'm not going to pretend like I can't. Like I said, I've, I've heard this occurring. You know, and I know that those things did occur because I was at Corcoran at the time of Rudy the Brute. I wrote the incident reports associated with his rape of other inmates. You know, so I know I have firsthand knowledge relative to that. Um, so I know that these things did occur. Um, but the callousness, the lack of humanity on the part of those individuals that allowed this to happen, that facilitated this against another human being. Is that, do, you, do you now feel a little bit, I don't know, I, I suppose I'm just wondering about the human condition and once mm. we're sort of put in those kinds of places, mm. what we can become, like how does that happen mm. that somebody loses their humanity to such an extent? I mean, I know there are psychopaths, I know there's 1% of the population that have no mm. empathy, but it feels like it's something bigger than that that's happening. I think the short answer to your question, Andrew, is fear. Mm. Um, you see, fear is is really the motivation behind most violence. Um, you know, whether that fear is associated with a particular bias or prejudice, which is usually the case, um, but it's usually fear that's at the root of the type of violence that we're talking about. So then what it becomes is a question of survival. And for many people, um, those individuals who have been vested, if you will, with the responsibility for their care and their protection, use that as leverage so that if they want to garner some kind of um, information, um, then they'll use that fear mechanism um, to um, solicit that cooperation from an individual. I mean, that's, again, another oversimplification. There are so many, many layers of, of um, corruption that we're talking about here. Um, and it doesn't just happen in prison. You know, it happens in jails and it happens in other institutions. It happens in mental facilities. You know, um, I, I read about it all the time. The people who are put in a position of responsibility, thus power, use that um, to pray upon other individuals in some capacity. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a psychiatrist or psychologist and, and I'm, I'm not, um, I don't have the wherewithal to address that on that level. Um, but I know that as a human being, I know how that impacts upon me and how that makes me feel. And, you know, we talk about the human condition and, um, you know, that comes in a multitude of forms. What's really important, I think, here is we has, have this discussion is human nature and what it is to be human and, you know, to, to engage in social mores and ways, um, that sense of uh, morality, if you will, and, and what that means toward our fellow human beings insofar as how we treat them. Um, and of course, you know, there are two sides to that. You always hear the argument. Uh, one, of course, is hate and the other is love. Um, I personally don't believe they are at loggerheads. I think what it really is, is fear. And, um, you know, how fear motivates individuals to succumb um, to something other than what they know their natural um, inclination and their humanity uh, to be. The LA Times reported that guards were laughing as they fed victims to Rudy De Brute, and Rudy was vilified as one of Corcoran's most violent inmates, a convicted murderer with a long history of sexual assault, a prison enforcer who received special favors from guards. He raped and beat at least a dozen cellmates during 20 years, many of the victims small and young looking like Dillard, according to prison documents introduced at the trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rudy the Brute was just one of them. I mean, he had others. Roger Dale Smith immediately comes to mind. I know for a fact, um, and when I say fact, I mean, I've actually read the record, his record, um, his documents of over 100 rapes. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity to, to talk with him about that. Now, you know, he eventually became known as Pincushion Smith. And uh, that was because he was, he was hit numerous times and survived it. Um, so he became somewhat infamous for that, but, uh, this is a man who, you know, I asked point blank, you know, why do you rape these men? And his response to me was that they like it. Wow. He actually, he actually believed that. And, um, you know, that's another, uh, story and, um, but, you know, Roger Dale Smith was um, the same as Rudy the Brute, and there are many others like them. And, um, you know, that's unfortunate that when you live in a controlled environment, that, that um, this is one of the realities that you're dealing with. So, so Andrew, Andrew is Jewish, and I was telling him, you know, earlier on, because he, he stepped up um, to do this, at the last minute and I was telling him, you know, this is the found one of the founders of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang who's now become this neo Nazi entity that's spread across the entire of America, a lot of murder, violence, mayhem and neo Nazi principles. But in the beginning, the philosophy was completely different. And one of the other founders was Jewish. Could you explain mm -hmm. to Andrew how that came about? Yeah, you want to remember that back when at the inception of these the, of these groups, um, it was about controlling your resources. And uh, that was true of the Aryan Brotherhood and, and uh, the Mexican Mafia and, and all the others. Uh, the really the only ones that had a manifesto, if you will, and it was a communist manifesto at that was um, the Black Panthers and the Black Varela family. But um, as the groups were formed, it was meant to control their resources. And um, that's something that people don't often think about, that the prison environment, as a controlled environment, when you have populations from 3,000 to 5,000 prisoners, represent a small city. So there are resources within that. And that's the essence of organized crime. You know, you provide a product or a service, and you receive compensation for that. So it's a matter of generating revenues and then utilizing those revenues toward developing the infrastructure of the organization. And so it isn't to say that you didn't have um, originally with the Aryan Brotherhood uh, racists. You did. Um, I can't recall. I've, I've thought a lot about it. Anybody that had a swastika on them, 
you know, I knew members of the Hells Angels who were also members of the Aryan Brotherhood who had swastikas. Um, but the idea of racism for the sake of racism was not a tenet that the Aryan Brotherhood subscribed to. It had no value. Um, it's only as they began to prosper, if you will, and um, take on other elements of crime uh, within the organized crime community and upholding that, um, that they began to adopt a privileged attitude, um, which oftentimes is referred to as white supremacy. You know, privilege comes in many, many different forms among um, a, a multitude of ethnicities. But the fact of the matter is that privilege in the context of white people is typically referred to as white supremacy. And I would agree with that. Um, but uh, in the case of the Aryan Brotherhood, T.D. Bingham is one of the founders of the Aryan Brotherhood, and uh, he was Jewish. And, um, you know, wore the Star of David tattooed on his body with pride. And um, it was actually something that I asked him about because it seemed a contradiction to me because, um, you know, my perception of the Aryan Brotherhood when I was recruited into it was that of, well, are these, you know, Nazis? Um, are these white supremacists? And it was actually four members of the Native American community who were members of the Aryan Brotherhood who explained to me that that was not the case. That, um, you know, the way they explained it to me was that, you know, they lived better in prison than they ever did on the reservation. And that resonated with me. I understood that. But going back to TD, I mean, I had asked him when he attempted to recruit me because I declined the offer to join the Aryan Brotherhood initially. Um, and uh, <laughs> I was looking at the Star of David, understanding, I mean, I attended synagogue when I was a youngster, so I understood what a Star of David was and what it represented. Um, and he saw me looking at it, and he said, yeah, that's right, I'm Jewish and proud of it. He says, but I'm not a practicing Jew is the way he referred to it. I'm not quite sure what that means, um, but I do know that his mother is Jewish and, um, and that uh, T.D. is Jewish, and he wasn't the only one. I mean, Tommy Silverstein, um, they say, well, you know, Tommy Silverstein was adopted, and, you know, it's like me. People say, well, uh, he's not Native American, and you know, whether or not I am or am not is irrelevant. The fact is I was raised Native. You know, in the case of Tommy Silverstein and T.D. Bingham and others, they were raised Jewish. And so that's what they subscribe to associated with that. You know, you have your Orthodox Jews, as Andrew will know, and then you get into a more contemporary aspect where they're a little more liberal uh, as it relates to the Torah and otherwise. I suppose, though, um, with the name Aryan, it's a reference to the ethnicity and blood. So if you were um, adopted as a, a Jewish person who's adopted, you, you don't have that sort of the race, you're still, you're still technically Aryan. So was that, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what was the importance of the name Aryan? If it, if I, it, think, I mean, yeah. go on, sorry. Yeah, no, it's all right. It's, it's a great question. You know, it's like uh, Mexican. It's like black. Uh, you have Black Panthers, Black Gorilla family. You have Mexican mafia. You have the Italian mafia. So Aryan is just a reference, you know, to not necessarily Caucasian, but European, you know, in that context, because you had uh, members who were Samoan, Native American, um, Filipino, um, people of color, but nonetheless, they were part of the Aryan Brotherhood. So initially with the founding members, um, the Aryan aspect was associated with the Shamrock. And the Shamrock, of course, was associated with Ireland. So you have that distinction and that conjunction. When you get into the context of um, Aryan as it relates to Judaism, then you're talking about something entirely different, primarily because of the, the history of the Holocaust and previously. I mean, as you well know, throughout the history of the Jews, they've been persecuted um, all the way back to biblical times. So mm -hmm. the idea of Aryan, and, 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 and interestingly enough, Aryan is a Middle Eastern term. Um, you know, that's where it comes from, is the Middle East. 
So it's it's not a Euro European term in that context. As you well know, Andrew, the swastika um, is on many synagogues, um, but it has an entirely different meaning. So it was how that symbolism was adopted by Hitler and his nationalist party, the Nazis. And that's usually the reference point that uh, we see today as it relates to the swastika. With, amongst the Native American community, it's a sun wheel, you know, and mm -hmm. represents movement and power as it relates to that movement. So, you know, it depends on who you ask. And um, well, that's not what it that's not what it means for the Aryan Brotherhood, though, is it? it you know? Well, it's a great question. I can't answer the question because I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. if the swastika has meaning to the Aryan Brotherhood today, then that's beyond my purview of experience. All I know is that when I was a member, it had no value. The shamrock had value. Now, you would oftentimes within that shamrock see the three sixes, the Antichrist, the beast. But that represented more anti-establishment than anything else. It was said that St. Patrick taught the Trinity to the Irish through the use of the shamrock. So given that, the 666 symbolism was incorporated to show anti-establishment. And if the Aryan Brotherhood was anything, it was anti-establishment. Hmm. And if it represented anything, it was anti-establishment. Outlaw, not just outlier, but outlaw in that context. But you had other organizations like neo-Nazis who embraced, uh, you know, the swastika and, and uh, Nazism and neo-Nazism and, and, and all that that portends, but they were actually enemies of the Aryan Brotherhood. And um, I went to battle with them many times. Um, not because of their manifesto as it relates to that neo-Nazism, but because for the most part, they were cowards. And so they would talk out the side of their neck um, about, you know, med, mud people and, and um, all these references to um, other ethnicities. Yet, when the battle was about to begin as a result of the way that they were talking to these other groups, they were nowhere to be found. So they placed the rest of the white population in jeopardy with these other ethnicities as a result. And oftentimes were stabbed as a result. John Abbott and I were talking about that when we did our interview. And um, it goes right to the heart of what we're talking about. Um, the idea of Nazism. Hmm. So, Michael, as the philosophy of the Aryan Brotherhood changed over the years then, did the attitude towards the Jewish founders such as T.D. Bingham change? Yeah, you won't see the attitude um, as it relates to um, Jews. Um, the issue was more blacks. Um, than anything else as it relates to white supremacy. So the primary enemy of the Aryan Brotherhood became blacks. And in truth, that was the case when I was a member. So the primary enemy was the Black Panthers, who was the first to attempt to recruit me. And then when I declined, I became an enemy. I wasn't even a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. And then, but when I did become a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, my primary enemy was the Black Guerrilla family. And um, again, um, who's to say what racism is? You know, I, I know a number of uh, members of the Black Guerrilla family who I encountered late in later years who explained to me their hatred for me. Um, you know, and what that stemmed from um, in their mind. Um, so, you know, I've heard people make the argument, well, you know, the whites were no less racist than the blacks. Mm, it doesn't really work like that. Not in my mind. Um, because we're talking about oppression and the subjugation of an ethnicity or a race to whites in general, and the potential hatred that occurs as a result of that. Um, you need only go into the inner cities today uh, to discover that. You know, the, the idea of racism, it's one of those subjects that, again, needs to be discussed in more detail, um, more openly because it still exists in this country. Um, there has a lot that, that's been done, but if you just look at something as simple as Black Lives Matter, you know, and the objection to that, I heard people say, well, all lives matter. Well, of course they do. You see, but not all ethnicities have been subjugated to another race the way the Blacks have been in this country through slavery. And again, that's an oversimplification. It's not something that I can imagine. 
I've been the subject of racism myself because of my fair features, but by Native Americans, not Blacks. I've had Blacks try to kill me because of my fair features, but I never looked at that as racism on their part. You see, I don't think the same can be said when you're taking a white person who's taking a position against Blacks because they're Black. In other words, because they're perceived as inferior or otherwise um, not worthy as human beings. And um, that's not a subtle distinction, nor should it be. Hmm. What, um, I get, you spoke before about fear uh, shaping mm -hmm. people in prisons and how people behave and stuff, and I suppose that also shapes prejudices. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, would, would the young Michael Thompson have held um, such nuanced beliefs about race or, or, or did you hold prejudices um, about black people, for example? No, certainly not. Um, first of all, I didn't have the mm, intellectual aptitude, um, whether academically or otherwise, uh, to make that distinction. It would be um, very disingenuous on my part to suggest that I did. Um, you know, I didn't even understand, for instance, when Yogi Pinnell attempted to recruit me into the Black Panthers, he engaged in this, essentially, what was a diatribe on, on his communist manifesto. And I understood none of it. I didn't have an inkling. I didn't have a clue of what communism was. I, the only factor that entered into my mind relative to that is I once did Spring Roundup with an actor called John Wayne. Uh, out on Irvine Ranch. And he used to lament about communism. I mean, he, he was, <laughs> not only was he a, a real American, but he, he despised communism. So that was my only reference point. And I think for any of us, that's what's required or should be required when we contemplate these subjects is what's your reference point? Well, my only reference point at that time when Yogi confronted me with his communist manifesto was what John Wayne had told me, communism is bad. And that's actually what I told Yogi, you see, and, and that's why I declined. But I did not understand communism, um, you know, Engels, Marx, none of it. Hmm. You know, Stalin, Lenin, didn't have a clue, Mao. But one of the ways that I actually learned how to read, because I couldn't read or write when I went to prison, was that I acquired Mao's Little Red Book because the Black Panthers and the BGF used to read it out loud on the tier every night. And so I would follow along in the book. And that actually helped me learn how to read. Now, I didn't comprehend a damn thing of what was being read. You know, I'm dyslexic. And so comprehension is another problem. So with like most dyslexics, I have to develop my own study protocol toward um, comprehension. And uh, that's true to this day. But no, to answer your question, Andrew, uh, the idea of uh, prejudice or racism, uh, first and foremost, it's not something that my elder would have tolerated um, on any level. Um, so his advocacy uh, to me was um, to be a human being and to be the best human being that I could possibly be. Of course, as a youngster, um, I don't know how much of that settled with me. I'd like to think that um, some of what I believe today is an offshoot of uh, what my elder taught me. Do you think, Michael, if Andrew Gold ended up in the California state prison system, he would be better off withholding his Jewish um, history and just identifying with the woods? No, I don't. Um, you have a number of, of uh, great programs, religious programs, um, where um, individuals who are Jewish are allowed to attend um, synagogue, if you will. Um, it's actually a chapel, but they have uh, a rabbi. And uh, every institution has a rabbi. And mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have a cantor, but uh, they have um, all the ceremonies associated with Judaism. Uh, you know, in that context, they have a special diet um, that um, is kosher that they receive. 
um, there's some resentment over that because it's the best food in the joint. Um, but that food is all donated by the Jewish community. And, um, but no, I don't think that uh, he should do that, uh, should that occur. And um, I hope it never does, Andrew. Um, I wouldn't last two minutes. Well, I'd be dead before I walk in. I'd I, trip I over my own feet and bang my head. That'd be yeah, it. Yeah. You would be surprised at, uh, you know, your survival instinct takes over. Mm. And um, so you might be surprised at, at how you would respond to that. But mm. the, the practice of uh, your religion um, would be encouraged. And sitting here right now, I would encourage you or anybody else um, to engage that. You know, I think that's the greatest value uh, of incarceration. One of the greatest values of incarceration was is the opportunity to engage uh, your spirituality, your religion, uh, and education. And the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation has evolved by leaps and bounds in that context. Uh, not only as it relates to officer training and uh, their code of ethics, um, but the programs that they now offer inmates, I mean, a lot, a lot more needs to be done. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah. But a lot of judicial reform has occurred in this state. Um, the Youthful Offender Act, the Elder Offender Act. I mean, the District Attorneys Association is attempting to repeal all that. And that's a, mm, an issue for another time, perhaps another subject. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, they now have programs available in prison that assist inmates to prepare uh, for when they are released. Most of that applies to the determinate term sentencing. That's, that's prisoners who have a determinate term that they're going to serve and then they're released. So they have the opportunity to educate themselves, to engage in, in um, self-help programming, and to engage in religious activities. And um, those have extraordinary value towards retaining um, and evolving in one's humanity. Just going back to the formation of the Aryan Brotherhood, um, mm -hmm. you were saying before that back at, at the time you didn't have, you, you weren't sort of learned enough to understand some of the uh, ideas around prejudice and race and things. Is mm -hmm. it possible that uh, perhaps some of the other people with whom you formed the group did have those kinds of bad intentions? Because it does. I, I'm just thinking of people listening and, and, and viewing and they, they're seeing like, okay, it's called the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, it's got a swastika. I know you were saying that in your mind, it didn't mean those things, but then also looking at where the group's gone now as well. It's, it's hard not to think it must, at least somebody involved in its formation had racist views. Oh yeah. There's a vast distinction to be made between then in the seventies and now. Um, back then you didn't have the swastika associated with the Aryan Brotherhood. You do now. Right. You actually see okay. it within the shamrock. Right. See? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a contemporary phenomenon uh, that's based on hatred. Um, uh, simply put, um, that's what it comes to. The opportunity to um, capitalize um, upon a situation uh, to, I mean, it's no different than the hate groups do that aren't in prison, you know, that are, are um, immersed mm -hmm. in our societies, you know, these hate groups, you know, uh, how they function and why they function. Uh, it's no different for the Aryan Brotherhood, you know, the idea of white supremacy, you know, and again, that's something that um, needs to be delved into deeper in understanding that hatred and where that hatred comes from, because I'm of the opinion that it comes from fear. Yeah. And, um, you know, fear is at the root of it. Um, you know, of course, the other, I said, the other side of that is love. You know, that isn't to say that they're in juxtaposition to each other. They're not. One does not equate to the other. It's not an either or. It's not black and white. But I am uh, unashamedly an advocate for love. And what that means is it relates to our humanity. And, you know, that's, that's a subject that can be discussed um, a lot. Um, as can hate, but I think these are conversations that need to happen. And, um, you know, we need, I see a lot of these so-called prison channels, you know, that they're advocating this, this idea of, of, you know, what prison is like, and, and that's okay because it educates the public toward understanding, 
you know, what it is to be human from the outside looking in. You see that idea of compassion. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Harry's. Having such a scratchy face, I'm always delighted to get a new Harry's set. There's a foaming gel, hydrating night lotion, and the razor with the weighted handle really gets the job done. The trimmer blade makes it so easy to get into those tricky places to reach. The shave gel offers effective lubrication and just comes off like butter. It's such a smooth shave. It shaves fast, efficiently, no discomfort, and it is so smooth by the end. The hydrating night lotion is light and non-greasy. Harry's is doing a zero pounds trial. Start shaving with the products, just pay for delivery. Save every time. Save on all your shaving products without sacrificing quality. You're in control. You can modify or cancel your plan from the account page. Make sure to support our podcast and start your own skincare journey by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, and have your trial set delivered to your door. That's harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. You know, for individuals who have committed crimes, I'm not saying that there isn't a need for crime, uh, for punishment as it relates to the crime, but Europe is far ahead of the United States in, in that capacity. You know, um, the United States is improving, but they have a long way to go. Whoever that individual was, way back in the beginning, that determined that it was okay to build a cell and put bars on the front and to house a human being in that cage, had something wrong with him. In my by my estimation, because in my opinion, the worst thing that you can possibly do is put a human being in a cage. It just yeah. You now I spent forty five years in a cage. I'm speaking from experience. I know the impact it had upon me. I know the issues that I'm still dealing with as a result of that. You see, in my pursuit of my own humanity. So you recommended that Andrew should embrace his religion then. Let's assume that he's going in on a drugs case into the mm -hmm. California state prison system. What prison survival advice would you give him? It's his first time offense. He has no clue what he's getting into. What, what, what advice would you give him to try and help him safeguard himself? Well, trust the process. It can be difficult to do because you're, you're, you're dealing with bureaucracy and in all bureaucracies you have variants and those variants can be very, very dangerous. You know, that individual that slips through the cracks, so to speak. Hmm. But the fact of the matter is, is like I said, the department of corrections has in place now programs. So depending on the level of um, Andrew's crime as a drug crime, you know, if he was um, heavy into distribution and sales, then that's going to put him at one level. If he's a, um, a dealer, that's going to put him at another level. If he's just a user, you see, and has committed crimes, burglary, robbery, otherwise to support his habit, then that puts him at an entirely different level. So his sentence is going to vary according to those given levels. So he may go to a level two. If he goes to a level two, he's going to have a multitude of programs available to him. He need not worry about gangs or anything else. If he goes to a level three, then that um, potential increases insofar as him becoming involved in gangs or, or getting into more trouble. If he goes to a level four, uh, that's the ultimate survival. That's the maximum security. And uh, particularly if he's a drug user. So what um, typically happens if he's a dealer or he's um, a member of a cartel, then he will continue that activity once he goes to prison. If, if he's a member of a gang, he'll continue that activity when he goes to prison. It's actually required of him. But if he's um, a square, you know, and I don't say that in any derogatory way because I'm a square. I'm the biggest square I've ever known. <laughs> I am. You know, people don't people don't realize that about me. You know, I've never used drugs. I don't drink. Never have. You see, so that's not been a part of, of um, my situation that I've had to contend with. My issue's always been violence. 
So in how you contend with that violence. And uh, fortunately for me, um, I've been able to do so effectively. You know, but even in addressing that, like I said, uh, I'm, for all the criticisms about embellishments and otherwise, they don't even begin to understand the story or know the story. And I understand that those criticisms usually come from their own experiences. But going back to Andrew and going into prison, he's got a drug beef. I think he'd be fine. Hmm. What, what would be your <laughs> biggest concerns, Andrew, going in? <laughs> I was just going to say, firstly, I just want to clarify, I don't have a religion. So the, the Jew, I'm an atheist. So, so the hmm. Jewish thing is, you know, Hitler would still gas me tomorrow if i you know if i yes. regardless of my religious beliefs or anything so it's an right. ethic it's sort of an ethnic thing but uh i just want to say it's quite a thrill because i'm not it's not often someone like me i suppose has uh my potential experience in prison discussed by a former drug lord and the founder of the aryan brothers <laughs> so it's really something to put on my report card <laughs> just the two of you sitting there discussing what would happen if i went to prison <laughs> Yeah, oh, Sean, Sean met my mum before. <laughs> well, you'll forgive us, Andrew. I mean, I, I, I imagine it seemed like, hey, guys, I'm here. You know, we we're talking about you at no. a party, but you no, no, I don't mind here. it. I don't mind that at all. I love it. I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I'm, I'm the most, and I think it's why Sean probably likes having, a, it's a bit of a contrast because I'm the most vanilla guy. Um, I suppose similarly to what you were just saying, I don't drink much either. I don't really do much. I just sit around and I watch a bit of TV and I go to sleep. And then Sean brings me into this world where <laughs> these things are being discussed. But yeah, I do what I watch. Look, I watch the prison shows. I watch Shawshank. I watch all these things and just... Mm. I'm a, I'm a coward. I really am a coward. And I, you know, what would I do if I was uh, Andy Dufresne? If I was, you know, uh, uh, what would worry me? Well, what happened to Andy Dufresne when he got those two guys, you know, those two or three guys held him down and started um, sexually molesting him? I mean, that that's the biggest worry. Or that thing that everybody says that when you go in, if somebody calls you out, you've got to like step up right away. Not in a million years do I step up. I sit cowering. <laughs> In the, I wouldn't be like a, a crying. I know they said, was it the Green Mile or Shawshank? When it's like, I think it's Shawshank, the first night, everybody cries on the first night. I think I'd be all right. And, you know, and I think I'd, I'd have to try and use charm to charm people uh, who, would, who, who might have uh, prejudice about me because I sound quite posh. And, and then go, oh, you know what? He's all right, though. I think that's what I would, you know, they'd think, oh, he's, he sounds posh and all high and lofty, but he's actually, he's all right. Maybe that is how I would get by. Well, I think that's actually an intelligent approach because you're obviously an intelligent person who's um, a savvy as it relates to technology and everything that goes along with that. And in mm. this day and age, that will carry you a long way. But it's also the ability to articulate yourself and you have a certain charisma that would serve you and that ability to articulate yourself, to communicate. And communicate communication is oftentimes the key. And mm. if you can communicate, some people say, oh, he's just manipulating me. Well, yeah. Um, and that's really what it comes down to, but that's the tools that you have available to you. And so that you would probably use. So, um, a heightened sense of awareness as it relates to technology, um, a shrewdness as it relates to the ability to communicate and articulate yourself, um, an education that, um, furthers your goals, you know, relative mm -hmm. to the ability to maneuver within a controlled environment. These are all assets. And uh, so I think you would do just fine. He's underestimating himself. He's six foot four. He's got quite a build. I'm looking up at him when it, I'm, and I'm six foot one. And in terms of the accent then as well, I know a guy who went to an independent school in, in the UK and in America, there was no discrimination because they just hear a clear sounding voice. But he got transferred back to a UK prison where there was discrimination against him because he sounded posh. So your voice, your, your, you, you speak very clearly. And I, I think you'd play the English card like I played the English card. You know, you're yes. a goddamn limey cousins from across the pond, that kind of thing. <laughs> and with your height as well, man, you, you, mm. you know, you're not mm. uh, a puny looking person. No, but it can make me a target because when I used to play rugby and I, and I I would see the other team line up at the beginning and they'd all point at me because I was six foot four when I was like 13. Luckily, I stopped growing because mm. I could have gone through the ceiling. But mm. I, I remember they'd all point at me because everyone wanted to be the first to take me down. And yes. I was shit scared. I was <laughs> just absolutely mm. shit scared. But you couldn't show that. So I had to be like, ready to go. But yeah, scared the hell out of me.
Well, that's the uh, thing about the male condition, if you will. You know, we talk, we hear a lot about toxic masculinity and associated with that is the idea that if you see a, a large person, you know, that's the challenge. You see, oh, that's, that's the it. one we go after. And yeah. I, I ran across that myself. I was six four myself, although I think I've lost a half an inch as I when I, when I hit my seventies. But uh, you know, and I when I went into prison, I weighed two eighty five. So um, it was like ah, oh, new challenge. Not just new me, but new challenge. Uh, nice. And so th there is that perception, but it's what you project. Also, it's your carriage, it's your demeanor, it's your body language. You know, in prison particularly. Um, as much as 90% of communication is body language. And, um, you know, you see that in the wild amongst uh, a wolf pack, for instance. But uh, in, in human beings, we oftentimes forget that we're animals too. And um, so body language becomes critical to how we communicate. So if, if you were to say, for instance, posture, then someone might call you on that posturing. They say, oh, man, that's a bluff. I'm going to call them on it. Ooh. And so, you know, it's, these are subtleties, nuances, if you will, associated with uh, a controlled environment, but they have application. And um, the thing is, is that there's an old rule that says, um, don't project yourself to be something that you're not. You see, if you do, sooner or later, you're going to be called upon to produce based on that projection, and you're going to yeah. fail. You know, you refer to yourself as a coward, I doubt that. But the fact of the mm. matter is, is I admire it also, you see. And the reason I do is that I don't have a problem with it at all. If you were projecting yourself to be anything other than that, you see, that uh, um, I'm Bruce Lee incarnate, mm. uh, th then that would be an entirely different situation, you see. And, and that's, you know, one of the things that where people get into trouble because of fear, they come into a controlled environment and they start posturing. They start projecting themselves to be something that they're not. And there's always that fellow that's in the sideline waiting to call him on that. Well, okay, you say you're all this. Let's see. Let's find out. Oh, my God. You know what I would do is I would, if I was going down, I would immediately frame Sean for another crime so that he'd be in with me. And then I would yeah. just stick to him like glue because yeah. I know Sean wouldn't let anything happen to me. And he'd, you've read all the books, Sean, haven't you? Confucius and all that stuff. So you would, you'd be in my ear going, just be cool. Yeah, but you're forgetting that Wild Man was my bodyguard. In <laughs> you would need Wild Man enough. <laughs> you're bigger than me. Wild Man's bigger, like both of us put together. Yeah, but you'd know what, you'd help us fight. It would be you know what it would make for a great movie wouldn't it i think actually because because michael always talks about resources so the yeah. gang is looking at how you would fit in as a resource <laughs> there's a lot of illiteracy you've got an education would they utilize him you know for, for reading legal paperwork helping them write letters things like that michael yeah yeah absolutely absolutely it was mm. one of the things that um I assume responsibility for changing within the brand is the idea of um, the effective utilization of your resources. And so individuals were seen as resources. In other words, I used to argue that you don't put the knife in the hand of a man that is not a knife fighter, is not a fighter, because you're setting him up for failure. So what you do is you cultivate those attributes, that skill set that he has. If he has an education, you know, if he has... Um, um, an understanding of technology, you know, because technology is used behind the iron gates also. You know, um, cell phones are very common. Back in my day, I used CB radios. I smuggled CB radios in. But Andrew would be utilized, as you correctly point out, Sean, in that capacity. So that if he has an education, he might be put into a clerical position where ducats are issued, you see, to facilitate the, the, the movement of um, not only prisoners, but commodities, you see, and maintain the books associated with that. If he was a drug dealer, dealer as opposed to user, and then he would be given um, um, resources to move within the prison system. And he would have protection as it relates to that. So he would not become a member, but he would become an associate. And associates become critical, you know, toward that you have nucleus the nucleus of the organization and you create buffer systems to protect that and you weigh the, the way that you do that is by the development of what are called cadres and they're not necessarily members but these are individuals that are utilized 
for their aptitude, their potential, and their capacity to get things done. And um, that's just good business. Hmm. Bloody hell, though. I want to. I want to get onto you know your story a bit, Michael. Just and I mean, how do you feel about that, Sean? Because I know you've you've yeah, obviously done interviews it. before, so I know it'd be retreading old ground a little bit. But what? What? I mean, what's your story, Michael? How did you end up in prison, and how did you end up getting shot so many times? Mm. Well, I ended up in in prison um, as a result of taking a position that uh, two individuals were going to kidnap two little girls for ransom from a man that I really did not know. And I received this information from the cousin of my wife at the time. And um, it just went so contrary to my um, sense of fair play, my sense of ethics, um, my code, if you will, that uh, uh, these two little girls were going to be kidnapped for ransom. Um, um, so I actually asked um, my wife's cousin, if he was going to contact this man and let him know he was working, the cousin was working for the two individuals that were going to facilitate the kidnap. And so he said, no, I can't get involved. I said, well, give me his phone number. And he did. And I called the man and told him, as it turned out, when, when they attempted to kidnap the two little girls, um, they were waiting for him. And so they took their weapons away from him. They killed him. They buried him. And, um, so my crime was in, in um, telling the father of these two little girls, who, I should add, was uh, the leader of a cartel, drug cartel, and the two individuals attempting to kidnap knew that he kept large resources of money in his home. So the idea of kidnapping the girls was to obtain that money. They were out on bail from a federal charge. They were going to abscond to Canada, as the story goes. So at any rate, that's what I got caught up in. What law, I, what, what law did they use mm, to get you on that? Because if you were trying to help the guy with his kids, mm, yeah. What, what, what's the law? Do? I know there's joint enterprise in the UK. It's, it sounds mm -hmm. similar. Well, back then it was called the felony murder rule. So that if you engaged in a felony, anything that happened subsequent to that engagement, uh, you were held accountable for. Uh, two years ago, the California legislature um, overturned that. And that's why I'm actually back in court. I maintained my innocence at trial and throughout the 45 years in prison. And then two years ago, um, with this uh, legislative enactment, uh, I filed a petition based on the felony murder rule under which I was convicted. So now I'm going back to court. And it, uh, as it stands right now, it looks like it's moving towards exoneration. Um, but the, the point is, is that back then, the felony murder rule allowed the prosecution to convict me of uh, first degree murder when there were never any allegations that I killed anybody, but because the individuals had been killed and I was associated with that by way of felony, then I was liable for those convictions. But what was the felony? Cause you just warned the guy. That's not a felony. No, one of the co-defendants said that I was actually there and that I had assaulted one of the victims. I always denied that, but he was the only one that said that. But that's what they used to say that I committed assault. So because I committed assault, which is a three-year conviction, but because I committed assault in the context of these individuals eventually being killed, that I was then guilty of first-degree murder. Did he get a sentence reduction for putting you in it? Um, well, he received favorable treatment, yes. He didn't get a sentence reduction. He got favorable treatment. He was sent off to Disneyland. We call it, it's the California men's colony in San Luis Obispo. And um, it's called Disneyland by prisoners because uh, only a certain group of individuals go there. Um, typically soft, um, being protected. They don't call it protective custody, but essentially that's what it comes down to. Um, you know, for that reason. I mean, this is a place where the prisoners have a key to their own cell. So now to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, literally a key, their own key to their cell. What was the motivation of the prosecutor to put you in it? Just like more convictions, more kudos? That's a great question. The prosecutor's name was Chatterton. And, um, 
I don't know what his problem was, to be honest with you. I mean, at one point, it seemed as if that was his, his sole intent was to convict me. I don't know if it was because I said that I was innocent and he honestly believed that I wasn't, although I don't think that's the case. You know, we reached a point in the trial when, um, you know, it didn't look good for me. So I was asked if I would take a lie detector test. I didn't hesitate. I said, yes, of course. I took two, one administered by the Department of Justice and one administered by the FBI. I got the highest plus scores in the history of polygraphy. I passed them both with flying colors. But then the district attorney went into court and fought against them being entered as evidence. And in California, even to this day, the scientific community does not support the validity of polygraphy, a lie detector. You know, um, it's used in business, you know, to see if you use marijuana, stuff like that. But in a criminal prosecution, particularly when murder's involved, it's not generally accepted as mm. um, reliable. Yeah, which is fair enough, I guess, because you, you, if, if you were well practiced at it, or if theoretically, or somebody were a psychopath or whatever, they might not, they might not jolt or jump at the idea of having to lie about anything. I think know, that's so true. Yeah, people accuse me all the time of being too calm. Um, and when you know whether that's true or not, I don't know. It's 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 my demeanor. You know, it I think is an offshoot of the way that I was raised. Um, you know, comes from dealing with catastrophic events over the course of my youth, and um, so I'm not really excitable. You know, in that, and uh, that disturbs some people, uh, unfortunately. But. Um, you know, it's it's not a measured um, contention mm. on my part. You know, it mm. it just it just simply it's simply who I am. But um, you know, th those kind of things oftentimes factor in. Um, but you know, going back to your contention about polygraphy and a, you know a sociopath, a psychopath, can be the lie detector. I think so. I do. Um, as well as others who are trained, I think they can also be a, a lie detector. But myself, you know, I was, I just turned 22 years old. I knew nothing of polygraphy. You know, I knew nothing of the judicial system. So the idea of being offered a lie detector test, you know, they emphasized FBI, Department of Justice, they'll know if you're lying, young man. And I said, okay, I'll take, I'll take it. Mm. You know, and I, and I did. So I think just the idea, they wouldn't allow that information to come before the jury. You know, that I was not only willing to take the polygraph test, but that I had passed them. Um, but just the willingness alone, I think, is um, indicative of a state of mind on my part. So, you know, to look at me today, given my 45 years of uh, prison experience, to say, well, you know, if you gave me a lie detector test today, uh, would I be more sophisticated in my approach to it? Of course. But back then, at the age of 22, no criminal record, you know, not having been arrested, knowing nothing of the system, to be offered a lie detector test and to agree to take it, I think speaks volumes and should. Um, and, and that's the distinction. But at any rate, that's how I ended up being convicted and going to prison. I'm assuming that the cartel boss was grateful for this warning. Did he testify on your behalf at the trial or has he ever tried to help you throughout the legal process since? No, he actually testified against me. What? Yeah, he attempted to uh, shift all the blame for the murders of these individuals upon me. Uh, he said that uh, the phone call I gave him about his kids going to be kidnapped um, was uh, just a, a plot on my part. Um, to steal away with the wife of one of the victims. And um, it, it's, it becomes convoluted in that context. I mean, it's a story in and of itself. But he utilized that to, to say that uh, this was all a ploy. You know, the value, I suppose, to this day is that he testified to that and the other co-defendant testified to that, the actual man that admitted to killing both individuals. And when he went before the board to obtain his parole, he actually admitted that the two individuals that were going to kidnap the two little girls approached him a week prior to engage in the kidnap plot with him, with them. So that didn't come out of trial, of course. If it had, 
then no one would have been able to contend that it was uh, something that I made up. But yeah, he, he, he testified against me in that context. He received a lesser sentence as a result. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the nature, uh, if you will, of, of um, prosecution, judiciary. Um, the idea that, you know, when you, you go into a situation like that and you have no experience. I was so naive as to think all I had to do was go in and tell the truth. And that's what I did. And it doesn't work like that. It's a personality contest. There are, there are a multitude of factors involved. Hmm. We talked about, um, you know, psychopaths and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering, given you say you're very, very calm in all these situations and you seem to handle mm -hmm. yourself very well. Uh, I mean, do you have moments when you've been, let's say, crying your eyes out or feeling really worried and scared? Or, or, or do you think you might be closer towards that sort of spectrum of, of sociopathy? I don't. I mean, it's a great question, and I think an appropriate question, given my history. Um, you know, I just had, uh, I did an interview the other day with a, a fella uh, that lives over there with you, James English. Mm -hmm. um, I did a podcast with him, and he asked me, he says, he sort of along the same lines, he said, uh, he said, Michael, do you ever cry? And I said, well, yes. And he said, well, when's the last time you cried? And I said, yesterday. And he said, what? And I said, yesterday. And he said, well, what were the circumstances? And I said, well, I said, you know, my, my wife has this thing about um, helping me evolve in my humanity. And, um, you know, we talk about arrested development in so far as my emotional development going to prison at the age of 22. So everything was kind of shut down. And I wasn't allowed over those 45 years to emotionally develop myself. So that's a process that I've actually engaged in here recently. And one of the things she did prior to my being released uh, was she, I never watched TV. So she purchased me a TV and she wanted me to watch it. And uh, I wasn't real fond of it. But now what she does is she picks a movie and um, human interest story usually. And we sit down and we watch a movie and inevitably there's some emotional content in that. And I end up crying um, as a result of being emotionally moved as a result of that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, so, you know, the capacity, you know, where I engaged stoicism for so many years, in other words, would not allow myself to cry, regardless, you know, because that idea that um, it's perceived as weakness, and it, you know, makes you vulnerable. And then you always have somebody lying in wait to capitalize on that perception. So here, in free society, I've been liberated. And I have the ability and the opportunity to engage my emotions. And what becomes important about that is emotional regulation. Um, so that you know that when you are crying, when something moves you that you understand why that I understand why. And the blessing is, is that I have a wife, um, who understands these things. You know, she um, has a master's in social work. Um, she's a mitigation specialist that works on death row. She understands tragedy. Um, she understands trauma. And that's really what we're talking about. Arrested development is a form of trauma. And so that when you begin to process that trauma and begin to understand um, how your emotional development has been arrested, how that's impacted upon your experience, particularly the lack of experience, your judgment in going forth and in interacting with people, you know, normal people um, on a normal basis. Um, these are all in many ways, you know, I'm that 22 year old boy, uh, young man, um, emotionally. So it's, it's a matter of um, evolving in my perspectives. Um, as a result of dealing with the uh, traumas that I encountered over the course of those 45 years, and realizing the degree of stoicism that I employed to suppress um, my emotions. So it's, um, there's, there's, Andrew, an enormous learning curve in that. Um, the blessing is that engaging the process and uh, having the benefit 
of somebody that's with me that um, is compassionate and understanding and knowledgeable about these things. Um, and so that helps me evolve. Um, my goal in life right now is um, to be as fully human as I can possibly be, to be the best human being I can possibly be, and understanding what that means, what I believe and why I believe it, you see. And um, to me, that's important. Um, so in many ways, I'm a child, and I don't mind being a child. Um, I employ the innocence of trust as a child would in many of my endeavors, uh, in my pursuit of understanding myself and others. And um, I enjoy being childlike in that capacity. Michael, you said there was a uh, naivety entering mm -hmm. the justice system for the first time in that you mm -hmm. thought you could just go and tell the truth. Mm -hmm. But what about the professional advice? Weren't you getting any, like, who was your lawyer? How did you obtain your lawyer? Was that person giving you professional advice and bringing you up to speed on that it was unrealistic to just go and tell the truth? Unfortunately, no. Um, the attorney that I hired, I was, I was in the process of adopting two little children. And I'd hired this attorney for that purpose. He was a family law attorney. And I didn't know the difference. He was an attorney. So I went ahead and I hired him as my attorney for this murder trial. And he knew nothing about it. Of course, the money he was being given was lucrative. So he didn't tell me that he had no experience in a criminal oh. case. This was his first criminal case. So he really had nothing to advise me on. And, you know, these are a lot of the issues that uh, as an organization, Live, Learn, and Prosper, that's our organization, that we deal with. We attempt to help people understand what it is to have uh, an attorney, but a proper attorney, one that's well-versed, you know, in the ins and outs associated with the crime that the individual has been accused of and, um, you know, has a track record, so to speak, so that they can advise that person accordingly. And there are a multitude of factors that typically go along with that. Um, but in my case, to answer your question, Sean, no. He was a family law attorney. Um, you know, it, just the amount of money back then, as you want to remember, this is the early 70s. And, uh, you know, $50,000 was what I was giving him. And, you know, to me, that was a lot of money. Um, so I was thinking, I was thinking you got railroaded because you had a public defender who just wanted to get the no. case closed. No, no, that was not the case at all. And in fact, we learned after the fact that the attorney I did hire had a nervous breakdown during the course of the trial. You know, there was no way to determine wow. that, but he didn't make objections that he was supposed to. I didn't know that, that he was supposed to. You know, I had a prosecutor, then I had two co-defendants who had three attorneys that they had hired um, that were opposing me. So I was going up against four attorneys and then my attorney, you know, and when we went back and we read through the transcripts and everything else, you know, we saw that. I mean, for instance, I'll just give you a brief example. The reason I'm back in court right now is that the um, jury was instructed that if they, they believe that I lie in wait for the purposes of committing assault, that I could be found guilty of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder. And that's an erroneous, completely erroneous jury instruction. It's used nowhere else. This is an instruction that the district attorney devised himself and that the judge accepted, but that my attorney did not object to. You see, so now I'm back in court. I just got a ruling out of the appellate court that was favorable to me that puts me back in court on these issues. But my goodness, it's been almost 50 years. You see, and I'm just now getting back into court on this very issue of something that my attorney should have been able to catch it's not just a technicality. You see, this is an erroneous jury instruction. The jury should have never been instructed this way. Hmm. The intent to kill is critical to a conspiracy conviction or a first degree murder conviction. But they were told that all they had to do was find that I lie in wait to commit assault. There's no intent to kill an assault. And I was convicted. Hmm. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But yeah. back then, I didn't know that. How, how do we get from, from this man who's, you know, about to adopt some children and is saving the lives of some others? 
um, and and all this stuff. How do we get from there to the man who has you know founded a gang and has been shot twenty two times? It's called survival. You see, that's the key. We were talking earlier about you and how you would approach the prison system. So I come mm. into the system. I'm six foot four, I weigh two eighty five. I've got a skill set of martial arts that serves me, and I've demonstrated that. Um, in jail because my co-defendants were sending what's called torpedoes at me to get me to testify a certain way. <laughs> and so I was fighting these individuals every day and putting them down. And um, I eventually had to put one of my co-defendants down and uh, an issue that he started, but he went into court the next day and said that I tried to kill him. So they put him in protective custody and they kept me where I was at. So now I go into the prison system and I've got all this following me. So, you know, I, I immediately um, meet certain challenges and I address those challenges um, to the best of my ability. You know, I, I often talk about the idea that I deplore violence and I do because I understand violence. But the fact of the matter is I'm very good at it. And because that's what my elder trained me, you know, in self-defense for that reason. Had he not trained me, I don't know that I would have survived. But the fact of the matter is, he gave me a skill set that served me when I arrived in prison. So ultimately, when I say it comes down to survival, you know, I go from from Chino to Tracy to to Old Folsom, and I'm confronted with um, uh, the big boys is the best way to explain it in the big house. So it comes down to survival. You're either going to be controlled or you're going to control. Mm -hmm. And given my skill set. I had the opportunity to control and I elected to do that. Now that isn't to say Andrew, that it didn't um, go contrary to my code of ethics, uh, to my spirituality, because it did. Um, and it was actually that that brought me away from the gang. The same thing that brought me to it, brought me away from it. That the idea of serving two fires, you know, my elders had come to visit me at San Quentin and they just simply told me you cannot serve two fires. So another way of saying that is that I was living two truths. And, um, you know, that's a Jekyll and Hyde type situation. So I had to choose. And I chose to step away for a multitude of reasons. But in the time that I was there, again, that was my choice. Nobody put me there. I made that decision. I made that choice. And everything that came along with it, including the violence. Don't you think then that if you'd have gone in as a squirrel, I mean, earlier on, you said, you know, if someone's got a skill set, it's going to get called out. If you went in as a squirrel, you may have survived it in a different way that wouldn't have enhanced. Did, I mean, did, did, for example, your gang uh, leadership enhance your sentence? Maybe if you'd gone in as a squirrel, you could have avoided that. And it, it, there would have been a different outcome that wouldn't have been as bad as because you said your, your skill set gave you this survival. It was a good thing. But maybe there could have been a positive outcome as a square. Well, and also, what does the square mean? What I think it does, just just some just not not violent or anything. Well, no, it, it's it's sophistication. You see, is really what it comes down to in your level of sophistication as it relates to that. I couldn't read or write, so I didn't have the education to rely upon. I had a skill set. You see, the ability to fight. And I had uh, a number of events in my life that were catastrophic events, growing up on a horse ranch, growing up on the reservation, being confronted with fly fires and floods and, and hunting and, and uh, you know, the mayhem associated with uh, ranch environment, uh, which is considerable, that gave me um, life experience as it relates to, to confronting catastrophic events. Well, prison is a catastrophic event. You see, so I was able to bring to the forefront my experience as it relates to contending with catastrophic events. I didn't have the intellectual capacity. You know, I didn't have the academics associated with it. I had a, a um, well-honed spirituality, a practicing spirituality, and I had the ability to fight as a warrior and believe myself to be such because that's how I was raised, to be a warrior. And um, so I brought those elements to a controlled environment and the ability to survive in that environment, given that skill set. Hmm. Now, when I learned to read and write, I took that a little bit further. You see, then yeah. I started developing infrastructure and creating a business and, 
And, um, you know, the more knowledge I acquired, the more I gave that um, knowledge practical application to my environment. Hmm. Prior, and, and, oh, sorry, go, go on, on, go on Sean. I was just going to say, um, well, well, how how does he get? I mean, I'm I'm a bit obsessed with this. How does he get shot so many times and, and survived? And I guess I also want to know. And maybe it's a bit of a silly question, but like, what does it what does it feel like to be shot? What's the what is that feeling? Yeah, I don't think there are silly questions, Andrew. To be honest with you, so you ask any question you want. Um, uh, going to the end of that question, how you survive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you, you learn immediately like at Old Folsom. You know, it's a big yard and it's open warfare. And if people have knives and you're stabbing each other and you got gunners on the rail, as many as four at a time, and you're caught in the crossfire. So the key is to keep moving. Again, it's a dance. And um, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So when you get hit, you know, hopefully it's not a vital shot. Hopefully it's not in the head, doesn't hit the heart, doesn't hit the lung, doesn't hit the liver or kidney, spleen, so on. And I've been very fortunate in that. Um, so it, it's a matter of utilizing that skill set, that dance, that movement, knowing how to knife fight so that you're not stationary, standing. People have this conception that a knife fight is, you know, something that they saw on TV with Jim Bowie and, and Davy Crockett. Um, it doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, coming forward into that survival mechanism uh, is the idea of um, knowing your environment, knowing your terrain. Um, and the virtual reality that I mentioned previously in the brain, and how that adapts to the environment towards your survival. Um, in other words, the brain doesn't have to take in the environment time and time and time again. By way of example, the first time I went to the yard and was involved in an altercation, everything happened very quickly. By the fourth time I went out to the yard, everything slowed down to slow motion because my brain had adapted to that environment. So it's understanding those things, how they happen and why they happen and how you can best utilize those uh, to your benefit. So how it feels to be shot, <clears throat> well, it depends. It depends on the uh, caliber, um, you know, the Mini-14 is a fairly hot round. It was developed during World War II for sniper action. It's meant to pass through the body. Um, in my case, that's happened, but um, I had one particular instance because of the angle of the trajectory from a 50-foot high wall and my movement, I was hitting the back and it lodged next to my spine as opposed to passing through. Um, that's the only way I can explain it. 30 years later, they removed it. But um, it knocks you down. It knocks the wind out of you. Um, it, um, you know, the first thing you're thinking if you stay conscious um, is, you know, what happened. And then you realize almost immediately, I can remember being shot in the side of the head with what was called a long range stinger round. Now, that was from the tower, and that was 50 feet down. And uh, the projectile was such that it hit me in the side of the head and peeled my scalp. It literally lifted my whole scalp up, hair and all. And um, I remember thinking to myself immediately that somebody had sundied me, punched me from the side. That's how hard it hit me, uh, because it actually buckled my knees. Um, and then I recovered and turned to confront my opponent and there was no opponent there and then realizing that I had been shot. So I had to turn back to the opponent I was dealing with um, just by way of giving you an example. And so the feeling of that was like being sucker punched, uh, being hit in the body is an entirely different thing. It knocks the wind out of you, drops you like a sack of potatoes. If you stay conscious, you realize you've been shot. There's not much pain. Um, depending on being stabbed, it depends on what you're being stabbed with. Um, if it's uh, a weapon that's been finely crafted, um, then it's razor sharp and you know what it feels like to cut yourself with a razor blade, right? So mm, intensify that a hundred, a hundred fold. Uh, that's what it feels like. Um, so if it's a, if it's a rougher weapon, 
it's more rugged. It's not as well um, manufactured. Um, and then and that can be painful, um, you know, because it's like being stabbed with a sharp stick. Um, you you feel it going in and you feel it coming out. And, um, you know, the biggest thing you hope for, because back in the day, they had what they called bone crushers. And this was a huge weapon, well over 12 inches, honed back on both sides, probably two inches thick, with a big old handle on it. And sometimes they'd two-hand it. And if they ran it into you, the thing that you hoped for was that, one, it didn't hit anything vital, and two, that it would actually hit bone, because oftentimes a bone crusher, if it hit bone, would stick in the bone. And that gave you an opportunity to take it away from your opponent. Sounds pretty gruesome, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, again, people say, oh, he's exaggerating and he's embellishing. You don't even know mm. the gist of it. If people had any idea, you know, they wouldn't make such silly, childish allegations because that's what they are. Um, you know, you don't really want to put it all out there because it is gruesome. And, um, you know, first and foremost, I don't think anybody really likes talking about that. But if it has educative value towards people understanding the reality of the situation, then, then it has value. So one of the motivations then to get big muscles was to absorb these shots so that you don't die? Was that, is that true? Um, no, that's only part of it, Sean. I mean, it helps. You know, that's not your intent. I mean, your intent is your strength. Um, you know, I used to be able to grab hold of a man and break his bones uh, with one hand and have done that. Um, you know, they used to give us heavy bags and I used to break the heavy bags just by striking them. Um, I had that much power, that much strength. You know, um, we had a 500 club where we bench pressed. There was three of us that bench pressed over 500 pounds. You know, people take issue with uh, the stories I've told about lifting weights and bench pressing. They say, oh, he couldn't have done that. Look, any man that's a power lifter, a weight lifter that can't live, lift twice his body weight is not a power lifter. Ask any power lifter. Hmm. You know, at one time I weighed 310 pounds. So I was pushing double that on the bench. It was no big thing. You see, the, the ones that used to impress me were the guys that weighed 150 pounds and were pushing 400 pounds. That's well over twice their body weight. You see, those are the ones that impress me. Those are the ones to watch. But big guys like me, nah. You know, it. Um, so you, you develop, you work out with weights to develop your strength because strength in battle um, is key. You know, that ability to, to backhand somebody or to grab hold of their arm and break their arm is it can, can become critical, you know, towards surviving. You know, to strike somebody one time with the heel of their hand to the, to the chin and, and knock them out or slap them to the side of the head and knock them out because that's a powerful punch. That has value, you see. So that's why you're doing it. The fact that you have that muscle mass on you when you're shot certainly helps. And when you're being stabbed, it certainly helps because I've been both. Um, and so it makes a difference. You know, if you did not have that mass, then if, if I look at my bony old ass right now, and if I were to be stabbed the way that I'd been stabbed back then, I wouldn't have survived it. Hmm. You see, that's the difference. Hmm. How did you get the food to sustain that weight? Because I know in Sheriff Joe Powers jail, he didn't give us much to eat. Yeah, you know, people talk about that all the time. What they didn't understand is that back then we had our own butcher shop. We had our own dairy. You know, we had our own eggs coming in. I used to sit down and eat 10 raw steaks a day with a gallon of milk and eat a flat of 30 raw eggs before my workout. You see, people say, oh, they didn't have that kind of protein. These are people that are talking about contemporary prison where everything is processed and you're not getting nutritional food. You know, you can buy protein powders. You can buy vitamins. All that stuff is available to people now, you know, toward their development. They don't have the weights anymore, though. So they don't really need that. But back then, oh, yeah. I mean, we had sufficient protein, you know, like I said, uh, you know, and sometimes I do that twice a day if I did a double workout. You know, they weren't big steaks. They were they, the steaks back then where they had their own butcher shop, but they'd run them through a tenderizer. And, um, so, you know, they were, mm, I don't know, 
seven inches long and maybe four inches wide, um, maybe a half inch thick, maybe thinner. But, you know, you eat 10 of those raw. And uh, like I said, uh, half a gallon at least of whole milk that just came off the dairy. You got a flat of 30 raw eggs. That's a lot of protein. And so you're going in and you're doing a four-hour workout with a lot of weight. Then you're resting, and then you may go back and do another four-hour workout. That's a lot of iron that you're pushing. That's what people don't understand. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the competition for size, then, were steroids prevalent? Some people did later use steroids. I know of individuals who did use steroids and became humongous. Um, but I never used it, and I never knew anybody that I lifted with that used, it, used steroids. You know, you're only going to get so big. Your bone structure is such, your, your muscularity is such, you only have so many uh, red twitch fibers and white twitch fibers. You can convert um, white to red, but you can't convert red to white. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these all become relevant uh, depending on you know, how you're lifting iron. And, um, you know, your, your chest can actually become so big, your arm's so big that you have to swing around your chest. <laughs> and I actually had that happen. Uh, and I thought, you know, I remember I had this conversation with TD because TD had this huge barrel chest. They called him the Hulk. He was a big old boy. But my chest had become so big that given my style of fighting that I found myself having to swing around my chest because my chest was in the way. <laughs> you know, and my arms were so big, you know, same thing. And when you have that much muscle on you, you tire. You know, your stamina isn't as great. Your endurance isn't mm -hmm. as great. So whatever you do, you better do it within the first 30 seconds, because if it goes beyond that, you're going to fatigue just from the muscle weight. And so it occurred to me, this really isn't beneficial. So I started dropping muscle weight and I focused more on becoming lean and, you know, having the muscle mass still, but with, within a lean context, I've got a picture somewhere I'll have to shoot to you. That'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And I'm um, in San Quentin at the time. So I'll get that to you and you can post it if you want or, but at least it'll give you for your own edification, that understanding. Wow. And um, matter of fact, this particular picture, I have an eye patch on. That's because I'd lost the sight in my eye. Um, I had a guard drop kick my head with steel toed shoes. And while I was chained up on the floor. Oh. So I'll just tell you now, that's what that eye patch is about. Wow, maybe we'll get to that next time then because we're at two hours now and a huge thank you both you guys for your time. Michael, do you want to tell the viewers where they can find you and support you? Well, you know, I'm coming up with my own podcast here in a um, very hmm. short time. Yeah, you know, like I tell people all the time, I don't have access to the internet. I'm able to talk to you today only because I have a studio engineer that facilitates it, third party, and I have permission for that. But I can't get on the internet check email. I can't even go on my own website. But I do have a nonprofit called Live, Learn and Prosper. I do have a book coming out, and so on. And, and I'll be pushing those things here in the near future. But uh, the thing that um, I most appreciate about this opportunity to come on and talk to uh, you and Andrew, and others that we've done podcasts with, is that uh, to avail the listener the opportunity to ask questions. And I encourage them to do so. Um, if they have a question, by all means, ask, and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, and I find that's oftentimes the case. And if there's anything that they want to know more about, uh, then let you know, and we'll do it, Sean. Um, it's really that simple. It's, it's about, you know, educating. Certainly, there's, you know, the sensationalism, and some people like that, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, I, I don't have a problem with telling war stories in context. Uh, I think that's important. I think they should have some illuminating or educated value associated with them. And hopefully that's the case. Um, but I have a deep appreciation uh, for you, for Andrew coming on today, and for your listeners. And um, so we say, All that we do, we do so that we may live as a people. We've got a deep appreciation for you, Michael. And perhaps... If that is the goal, then is to get more questions answered, perhaps a live Q and A mm -hmm. 
in the future and we can do yeah. that you know real time and, and and take all those questions if that's something you'd be up yeah. for yeah oh yeah absolutely i think it's a great idea now i'm always up for that you know when people stop asking questions and i know I, okay i'm done i've done enough that's it you see and i can move on to other things but as long as people have questions then i'm available to answer them it's really that simple it's all about right. giving back all right, well, viewers, look forward to that. I'm going to try and incorporate Bruno into okay. that because he was supposed to be with us tonight. Andrew oh. has graciously stepped up with 20 minutes notice. <laughs> tell, do you want to tell the viewers, Andrew, where they can find and support you? Well, first I'd say, yeah, thank you so much, Michael, for, for coming on. It's been so great speaking with you. Sean, not so great speaking to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, if, if at some later date you happen to be watching something like this on my channel, do go and check out Sean Atwood's channel. I'm co-hosting with him every week. Go and subscribe to that lovely man's channel. Uh, and also, you know, Michael's podcast. Do go check that out um, and all of that. And if you're watching this on Sean's, please come over to On The Edge with Andrew Gold. That's my channel. And uh, just say, if you say hello or something, say you came over from from sean i always like hearing that yes so michael and andrew's links will be in the description box below this video so please support their work and huge thank you again guys for staying on for so long mm. and huge thank you to the viewers as well for joining us put any questions in the comments and take care out there wherever you are in the world we will see you next time thank you for watching cheers bye bye right so if you enjoy true crime books Gadfly Press is proud to announce the publication of Son of the Cali Cartel. You may have seen the Cali Cartel as represented on Narcos. A lot of that was BS. William lays it down in this book, what actually happened. The Cali Cartel, they took over from Pablo Escobar. They were the biggest cartel in the world, dealing billions and billions per year, US dollars. And the four heads out of the two most important ones were... Miguel, which was William's dad, and his brother, Gilberto. When Miguel went to prison and Gilberto went to prison, William was running the cartel. Could you imagine running a multi-billion dollar cartel? And the DEA, war on drugs, they made them public enemy number one. William got shot up in an assassination attempt in a restaurant. The book starts out with that story. His mates got murdered and he just barely made it out alive. So if you want to check it out, it's available worldwide on Amazon as an ebook, audiobook, and paperback. And the link is in the description box below this video. Cheers. Enjoy the podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, been an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialized with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honor. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor.